Hi, it's Calm here and the purpose of this video is to talk about this upcoming book, The Secret Horsepower Race, which is about World War II piston engine development for fighter planes. And um, there's a lot of kind of bad info or just no info out there about it. So what I'm going to do is do a kind of very rough video just to kind of show you about how engine performance is reflected by the supercharger, which kind you might have, because everything kind of depends on that. And if you don't know what's going on with that, um, nothing else is really going to make any sense. So this is the first video. I'm still kind of figuring out the lighting and the sound. So um, I think it's not bad, but it's not it's not quite a Hollywood yet. But that probably doesn't matter right now. So basically, um, supercharging of engines started off in World War One, which we're not going to talk about it in the book, but that's the kind of root of all of this. So basically what happens is, in the atmosphere we've only got 21% oxygen in the air and all the rest of it is basically nitrogen, it's inert, so you can't use it to burn the fuel. So air is actually um, it's pretty rubbish to be honest, as a, an oxygen source for the fuel. Um, so when you go up in altitude the problem gets even worse because once you get up to 20,000 feet or so um, the amount of oxygen is actually 10% so that means you can only burn half the amount of fuel so the engine makes half the power so it's a pretty big problem. So basically if we draw a couple of graphs okay so this one is going to be engine power and this is going to be altitude so we'll call this 20,000 feet it's obviously sea level and for horsepower I'm not going to write numbers on there but basically when the first engines are being supercharged they're mechanically pretty useless so um, they tend to break a lot so actually these first superchargers were what were quite a bizarrely called sea level superchargers because basically all they could do was maintain the power of the engine that sea level higher up they couldn't actually raise the actual max output of the engine because the cranks had stopped breaking or the oil system had break down and all this kind of stuff so that's they're all kind of the same, but that's why they started to be called sea level superchargers at the beginning, because that's all they could do. So basically, if we say this is the actual mechanical limit line for the engine, so let's just say that's the maximum power the engine can make before it mechanically breaks. So we'll need another graph underneath to fix that. And this here is going to be altitude as well, but this is actually going to be manifold boost pressure. So that's the, obviously the air pressure inside the manifold of the engine before it goes into the cylinders. So that's our pressure after the supercharger. So basically we're, we're going to call that one atmosphere, um, which is pretty much well, it's a bar. So 14.7 pounds per square inch, if you like. So we're going to call that one bar manifold air pressure. So for our engine, if we don't have a supercharger, if we start running it, this is altitude, remember. basically get that so what we're saying is at 20,000 feet if we take this line back the engine is making 50% of the horsepower and we'll get exactly the same show up with the manifold pressure so the manifold pressure at sea level is going to be one bar because we've got no supercharger and the air pressure at sea level is one bar. 
and basically the, the manifold pressure and the engine power follow pretty much the same line. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that in real life and in fact it's not an absolute relationship between density and um, sorry pressure and engine power. There's actually a bit of a bit of um, interplay between air pressure and um, the density because the two don't change in quite the same way but it's it's pretty close we're only arguing about a couple of percent here or there but if you want to be pernickety about it um, there's some there's some maths to go into there but that, that's not really what we're worried about right now so basically if we have a sea level supercharger the early ones were mostly driven from the crankshaft so um, we do actually have turbocharged engines in world war one um, but basically really what we're going to talk about here is just superchargers what i mean by the supercharger is um, they've both got a compressor the turbo and the supercharger but the supercharger typically means it's mechanically driven so it's basically a gear off the end of the crankshaft um, this is quite tricky because aero engines tend to be fixed speed things so the big ones you're looking maybe 3000 rpm and um, because the supercharger is driven off a gear once the engine's at 3000 rpm which is your max the supercharger is running at constant speed so once you've throttled up for takeoff your crank and your supercharger are running at the same speed and that's going to be the case all the way up um, to max altitude really so that means and this is important to remember that the supercharger speed from takeoff all the way up including at combat is, is fixed pretty much and um, basically th this can happen really because just to add a further degree of complication with the propeller has variable pitch um, which is called constant speed so basically the engine speed is actually regulated not really with the throttle so much but actually um, it's the propeller pitch so you can unload the engine more by changing the propeller pitch so that's why it's called constant speed unit because the propeller pitch is changing to maintain your engine at the fixed speed which is its peak power output so basically from 1940 onwards you can consider that all the planes alloyed and german have um, propellers which the pitch can vary so basically speaking if we have a sea level supercharger problem we've got the supercharger is fixed to crank speed so if we boost the air pressure at sea level actually we don't have one bar manifold pressure anymore um, we're actually going to have a lot more than that so if we take a slight supercharged engine say 1.4 bar so we'll say here if we put a supercharger on it at sea level we're starting off with 1.4 bar so we've over boosted the engine but nevertheless let's look at what happens after that so this is manifold air pressure so actually it goes down in the same way we've got a problem here though because we've actually over boosted the engine and so potentially if we haven't developed our engine enough um, we'll break it at takeoff because we can't slow the supercharger down at sea level because air is very dense here so that's why we've over boosted so what we have to do is throttle the engine basically so we can't have this bit so our engine can only survive below one bar manifold pressure so actually the engine performance line well in fact now instead of being like this we've actually lost this area here and in fact it's actually worse than that because if we use a butterfly throttle which is just a flap valve before the supercharger to throttle it the problem we've got is that we're not slowing the supercharger down but by throttling 
the intake, we're actually trying to get the supercharger to run a higher pressure ratio than it actually needs to to achieve what we wanted. And what happens then is we get what's called a pumping loss. So basically the supercharger is trying to suck harder because we've choked off the inlet. So what that actually means is at sea level we actually get less power. So the green line is actually the engine power will get from takeoff with a supercharger with a fixed speed gear ratio. So that's a pretty interesting one. Once we get to here, the throttle is fully open because the lower air density means that even with the throttle fully open, we're still just at what we consider to be our mechanical limit line for the engine. And then after this point, our supercharger can't run any faster. We've got the throttle fully open and we will begin to lose power in the same way as before. And interestingly, this won't be reflected in our boost pressure graph, which will also show our boost line, just flatlining basically. So the difference between this slope and this being flat is that the manifold pressure doesn't include the pumping loss because that's a mechanical loss. It's actually power is being sucked out of the crankshaft when the engine is throttled. Now there's a way around that and basically it was, what's this seat? I don't know if the autofocus is going to work but this is Dr Coleman and um, he was a German engineer at Daimler-Benz and he's patented uh, this system here by varying the speed of the supercharger relative to the crankshaft. And basically what we have is, this is one half of a Daimler-Benz supercharger drive coupling. So in here we've got oil and there's a rotor inside which is connected to the supercharger. And this side is connected to the crankshaft. And when this is filled with oil, it's about one to one speed. And as we lower the amount of oil in here, it, it turns at a different speed. So it's a kind of variable speed gearbox basically. And so the reason this was done is because it means we don't have to have a flat um, sorry, we don't have a drop in our engine power when we throttle the engine because instead of choking the supercharger off with a butterfly throttle, we actually slow the supercharger down to avoid overboosting at takeoff. So uh, this was first done in the Daimler Benz uh, 601 engine. Um, the 600 actually had a gear driven supercharger, so it's the 601 was the first that had this. So a 601 engine will in fact have almost a flat horsepower line from takeoff um, up to rated altitude. And rated altitude is when the supercharger is spinning at its maximum speed and the throttle is fully open. And so basically you tune that by what the gearing will be from the crankshaft and how big the, the supercharger is. It's basically when the throttle is fully open. So what this what this means is if we've got a Rolls Royce Merlin, the power takeoff is going to be here. It looks like the power is increasing, but it's not. Actually, the power should be here. This is pumping loss here. And then once we get up to rated altitude which is going to be something like um, 18,000 feet, something like that. Then the power begins to drop off. So horsepower, altitude, 
this is obviously in your Mark 1 Spitfire. So a DB601, which would be in the Messerschmitt 19E, for example, it its power graph does not look like this. It actually is going to be something approximately like that. And then it will also fall off in the same way. It actually ends up being a slightly different point because the gearing's not the same, but the point is that by having a variable speed supercharger drive, the Messerschmitt 109 with the Daimler Benz engine is able to exceed the power output of a design like the Merlin, which has a fixed speed supercharger. So basically what that means is that this part here is basically free horsepower. Um, so this would give the Messerschmitt a slight speed advantage at low level. So just to give you an idea, with those particular engines and those planes, this would be something in the order of 100 horsepower. So that's about 10% at the time. It'll take a bit. And um, so this is a kind of fundamental uh, thing we have to bear in mind when we're looking at um, different supercharging means in, in World War II engines. And um, in some future videos, what I'm going to be discussing is what all happens with this when you've got a turbocharger, which means that the speed of the supercharger compressor is driven by the exhaust gases. And what this means is we can vary the speed independently of the crankshaft, and so we can do lots of different stuff with that. And um, we'll also talk about gearboxes, because this only applies with a one speed supercharger and obviously we can have more speeds than that so that was another development direction that Rolls Royce took and there's lots of advantages to that too so we'll talk about that in the next video so I hope you've enjoyed that and what I would really like you to do is to make sure you go to my website here and register and uh, the reason you should do that is because all my video interviews with engineers are available on my website and you can only view them if you register which costs absolutely nothing so i suggest you do that and um, thank you for watching and stay tuned for future videos and i hope you learn something